I mentioned animal welfare, and I think it's another part of this problem. I, I think, you know, the environment is huge. I think human health is huge, and they're being impacted by this system that we have in this country of growing our, our animals. Um, but the impact on the animals themselves is quite devastating. And again, I, I saw this. And the confinement, the, the tiny amount of space that these animals are crammed into. Um, like I said, my book, last book was about SeaWorld. And if you go down the road, you'll see the killer whales. And they're in pools. And, and relatively speaking, those killer whales have a lot more space to move around than chickens and pigs and dairy cows do. Um, but they're still highly confined. And in my opinion, it makes them crazy. It makes them act out. It makes them aggressive. And that's why Don Brancho here in Orlando was killed by Tilikum. Tilikum has now killed three people. Um, you can't confine a wild animal used to ranging 100 miles a day into basically what amounts to a swimming pool without compromising the welfare of that animal. Well, at least they have a pool. <laughs> uh, the, the laying hens, hens that lay chick uh, eggs typically live in a cage about the size of this piece of paper, and they can't turn around. Um, the dairy cows, like I mentioned, particularly in the Midwest, never see the light of day. They are indoors day in, day out. They're not allowed out on pasture. They're not allowed to do what cows do, which is graze. Um, and the pigs, they bring them in. Well, first of all, they have different uh, operations, but they, they, they disseminate the sows. And then the sows are kept in these cages called farrowing crates, where they can barely get up, they can barely turn around. And then when the, the, the piglets are born, they, they nurse from the mother, but the mother's in a cage because they're so worried, there's so little space that the mother might roll over and crush the piglets. So the piglets are physically separately, separated from the mother. They can still get to her milk. Um, and she is kept virtually her whole life in this cage where she can barely stand up, she can't turn around. Uh, and as soon as she has a litter, they impregnate her again. And that's her life. It's just, it's just horrifying. Then those piglets are taken and they're put into these barns, these giant indoor barns, which have um, little sections that are sectioned off by, by walls, low walls. And when they're little, they have enough room to run around. I went to one, I, I saw the piglets, they look very cute and happy and clean. But then they start eating and then they start growing. And by the time they're ready for slaughter, again, these pigs can barely move, they can barely turn around. And just a couple of stories that I witnessed that were shocking and heartbreaking. Um, I was on a farm, a family farm in Illinois, and across the street was a, a CAFO, a, a hog factory farm. And it was quite large, and at night, they would literally, the workers there, the owner didn't live there, the, they hardly ever live. The, the people who own these farms don't live nearby because who would want that? And at night they would turn off the lights, the workers, and go home. And the pigs were left to their own devices. Well, when they get that big, they start fighting with each other. And they'll bite each other's tails off, which is why they typically dock the tail, they cut the tails on these pigs. But they still fight, they still injure each other, and I heard it, and it went on all night long, screaming and crying. It sounded like a thousand children being tortured. I couldn't sleep that night. The sound was just so unreal, not to mention the smell and the other issues going on. If you live across the street from a factory farm, you're dealing with a lot of issues. And it, it broke my heart, to be honest. And frankly, I. I I consume eggs and dairy, I always buy organic, and there's some problems with that as well, which I'll get into in a second. Um, I hardly ever eat beef, and I, I virtually don't eat pork at all anymore. After just hearing that sound was enough for me to certainly never buy um, commercial pork, possibly from a farmer's market or an organic farmer, uh, but I, I, I basically don't even do that. And then the dairy cows, and, and this was also heartbreaking. There's a, a giant mega dairy in Indiana. They have 10,000 cows. 
and it's a tourist attraction. It's like a Disneyland. And they bring the tourists in and you get on a bus and they drive you around and you see all the facilities and they take you to the milking barn, which was this giant, it was like something out of Stanley Kubrick, this giant wheel that slowly, slowly, slowly moves around and they would bring the cows in and then the workers would attach the milking machines to them and they would slowly turn and it's time so they can milk that cow until it does one full revolution and then they try to back that cow out and send it back to her barn. Well, sometimes the cows didn't want to move or didn't want to go anywhere and they would fall and they would use bull hooks to lift these cows up. And, and, and you know, they're, they're, they're peeing and pooing everywhere and they're slipping and sliding in their own waste. Um, after the dairy barn, we drove through the, um, the veal crates. Now on a dairy farm, males have no purpose. All they do is consume. You, the males are turned into veal. And typically what happens is they are put into crates about the size of this box, I would say, with a little tiny opening in the front for them to breathe. They can't move. That's why people say, oh, veal, you know, it's white and tender. Well, the reason it's white and tender is that these animals are never allowed to develop any muscle mass whatsoever. They're ripped from their mother. They're put into these things. And we saw row after row after row after row of these crates. And you can see the little noses sticking out uh, from the, the little slot that they put in there for them to breathe. And they'll become veal. Then they took us to the birthing barn. And that was the most shocking. Uh, again, to turn this into a tourist attraction, they bring busloads of school kids into this place. There's an amphitheater, and then the stage is a glassed off area with a little straw on the ground to make it look a little more pastoral. And one after another, they would lead these female cows in, and they would give birth. And the calf would, would come out, and they would grab it. And the mother is not only looking out at the audience like, I'm, you know, this is a private moment. I'm giving birth to my young, and there's 200 school kids taking pictures and looking at me. Um, and then they would immediately take that calf and give it formula. And the sound of that mother braying and crying, it was so heartbreaking. But they wouldn't even let the calf suckle from its own mother's milk because that milk is a commodity. So they give a formula. And the girls were sent to the pens, and the boys were sent out to the veal. Um, even on organic dairies, and I went to an organic dairy in California, and yes, those cows are out on pasture, they're much happier, they're much healthier, but the same thing. And I saw these two calves in a front loader, terrified, falling over each other, and it was explained to me that they were males. And they don't belong on a dairy farm. So they were going to be sent off for organic veal, but they're separated from their mothers and they're transported around the farm in a front loader. Um, and then on chicken farms, of course, and this includes uh, organic chicken farms, uh, I'm sorry, egg farms, there's no place for males on an egg farm. They're useless. And you've probably seen the videos of what the, the chippers that they put them in, and these little baby chicks once they're sexed, the females go to the cages, the males get pulverized and get turned into fertilizer and dog food and cat food and things like that. So just from an animal welfare point of view, um, there are, there's a lot of abuse. And I don't believe that animals raised in fear and torture are good to eat and raised on these products. You know, we say you are what you eat, but you are what you eat eats. And we're feeding them, and we're confining them, and they're breathing foul air, um, and there's a lot of suffering and a lot of pain, and then they, they go to slaughter. So it's, it's pretty depressing, and things have not changed much since I wrote my book. Uh, my book came out in 2005. Um, and it, during the period that my book takes place, there was, of course, an election. And Barack Obama promised so much 
for reforming this. And I'll talk about some of the reforms that I believe should be implemented. And, and his administration has failed. He's done virtually nothing to control this situation, um, to further regulate, to uh, enhance alternatives to factory farming. Um, and his uh, USDA has been just completely in the pocket of these large agricultural agribusinesses. And it, it was disappointing because a lot of people in my book supported Obama very enthusiastically because of the promises he was making during the election, and virtually none of it came through.